I'm Wanda with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. We are happy to welcome you here in these strange times by bringing authors directly to your living room or your backyard, your bedroom or your kitchen. We have a very special treat for you today and we're recording this and we'll share it when it's available. Welcome to Reader Meet Writer Southern Edition featuring Donald Pomisano with his new book, A Leader's Guide to Giving a Memorable Speech. <laughs> We hope to provide some retail therapy, entertainment, and distraction, all in the same wow. hour. Donald J. Pomisano is a New Orleans native, retired surgeon, and a U.S. Air Force veteran. Today's book is derived from Dr. Pomisano's popular Tulane University School of Medicine seminar, How to Give a Memorable Speech, that he teaches to medical students and faculty using lessons learned from his extensive experience of over 1,000 speeches and interviews worldwide. He is a frequent keynote conference speaker and trains executives on leadership and effective speech delivery. Dr. Pomisano served as the American Medical Association president in 2003 and four and president of the Louisiana State Medical Society from 1984 to 85, where he was inducted into its Hall of Fame. Prior to his latest book, Dr. Pomisano published On Leadership and The Little Red Book of Leadership Lessons, both of which remain popular. Donald, let's hear from you. Thank you, Wanda, and thank all of you for taking time from your busy day to be here today. I hope that you are well, and I hope that you are safe during this pandemic. It's a privilege to be with you. And I wanna start off by telling a story. You will find in my book, and I hope you'll find in this discussion today, that stories are very important to give if you want your speech to be memorable. In the mid 1980s, the first opportunity I had to give a speech to a large audience. I had given speeches before with the Medical Society. I'd been on TV debating plaintiff attorneys about medical liability reform, but I had never been in an auditorium with 500 people waiting to hear me speak. However, I was not the keynote speaker at that time. I followed the keynote speaker. And I was in the audience, in the middle of the auditorium, about five seats away from the middle aisle. They rolled a big device down the middle aisle and it was even with our row. The speaker came out on the stage. He had no notes. He looked like he had stepped off the cover of GQ magazine. <laughs> he had an expensive and I assume Italian suit. And he looked out over the audience. He did that dramatic pause that many believe is essential at the start of a speech. And we all waited in anticipation. He had achieved the effect he wanted. Suddenly to my right, this device, something came out of the top of it. And I, at first in my naive state, I thought it was a hologram because I had just read about a hologram in the National Geographic. And I said, wow, I'm going to learn something today. And I started to take notes. Well, it wasn't a hologram, it was a fire. And people started to scream and staff came in and they put the fire out immediately, told everybody to calm down. They took the device away. It was his projector with the old large lantern slides. The man stood on the stage and stared at us and we stared at him. It appeared to be an eternity and suddenly two people came out on the stage and took him away. And someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Dr. Palmasano, would you mind going to the stage now, now and doing your speech? Wow, 
I had all sorts of books with me with my anxiety about forgetting something. And so I immediately went up to the stage. Now, I felt bad for that man, and I never heard of him again. He was a popular speaker, and he appeared to have just disappeared into the abyss. Many people have the fear of that happening to them, and that's why they won't do a speech. But we should all be prepared to do a speech. We should all be prepared to say something at a wedding, perhaps a minute or two. We should be prepared if we are privileged to speak of our friend who died, to give some comments. And one attorney many years ago, in 1975, when we were working to get our liability laws changed in Louisiana, he taught me this. He said, the best extemporaneous speech is the one well prepared. So I remember that. And that's part of what I have in the book. You should always be prepared to give a speech. It might be a quote that means a lot to you and you hope it will mean something to the audience. Now, why did I have this connection with that speaker who panicked and forgot what to do? He was at a loss without his slides. I talk about that in the book. So that will never happen to you if you follow the advice in my book. That will never happen to you. But I was a child in the Irish Channel in New Orleans where I was born, on Magazine Street, on top of a restaurant and bar. My dad was a heroic policeman. And one day some gang members from the projects tried to recruit me, and my dad learned of it. The next thing I knew, I was punished, so to speak. I had to stay upstairs for the rest of the month and I got some mail in for my parents and I opened it up and it was a book club. So I decided they should join a book club. So I, I joined the book club for them. And I had all these books to read, but the next thing I knew I was at a boarding school, but it didn't have my grade. And my dad convinced the principal to put me in the next grade. And I told my dad that wasn't the right thing to do. I mean, I can't go from the second grade to the fourth grade. And he said, yes, yeah, you're smart enough, you can do it. So they thought because I was smaller than the other kids and I, they thought I had a problem with self-esteem because I was smaller, they wanted me to be there and do a speech on stage to raise money for a new gym. So all the parents came from all over, some from out of the state, and I was the first one on the stage. And I had four lines to, to memorize and speak from the Bible I got up there and something happened I did not expect. They turned out all the lights and they put a spotlight on me. And I was like that deer in the headlights and I panicked. And I kept saying, what's the first word? And nobody said anything and they came and took me off the stage. So I knew what that man felt like, although it hurt him more at his career level. I was just a kid and they said, gee, this kid is really sad. He can't even remember four lines. But my dad told me, he said, son, don't worry about that. He put his arms around me and he said, the next time I see you, I'll bring you something. It will never happen again. And it never happened again. What did he bring me in three weeks? He brought me a rather large echo tape tape recorder, reel to reel. I had no idea what it was. And he said, son, Every day you speak into this, play it back, and do that 15 minutes after school every day. And I did that. And the other kids were curious, and they started to do that with me. So part of my message in the book is that you have to practice over and over. It's much easier now because you have these fancy phones, iPhones, other brands of phones. You can record yourself. You can videotape yourself, and you can watch yourself. And when you watch yourself, you will see things that you don't need other people to tell you about. You will see that you're blinking your eyes too fast. You will see that you're turning your head to the side. You will see that you're moving from side to side. And once you see that, you'll never do it again. For some reason, once we realize what we're doing, we don't do it anymore. There are four important things to giving a memorable speech. So what are these four things?
You got to be knowledgeable about the topic. You know that people in the audience, there'll be some people who know a lot about the topic. But you have to be up to date on all the latest things. Otherwise, you lose your credibility if you don't know how to answer a question. Now, you, somebody may have a question that you can't answer, but then you should be honest. One of the most important things in giving a speech is that you have to be authentic. You can't fake it. And if you don't know the answer, you just tell them you don't know the answer, but that's a great question and you'd like to learn. We'll talk about it later. Second, you have to have passion. That's entirely on you. You can't go up to the microphone and say, oh, I want to tell you a hello and give this speech. You got to have a lot of energy. Some people say, I get really nervous. I have to go to the, the bathroom. I feel like I'm going to vomit. Uh, I have all these problems. That's good. That's really good. What is that? That's the fight or flight mechanism. When you go into battle, you don't want to eat a big meal before you go into battle. Why? Because if you get a lance spear in your abdomen in the old days, what would happen? All that food will be in your, in your belly, right? I've operated a lot of people, motorcycle accidents, and they had a big meal at the local uh, chicken place and all of that with the beans and so on. That was all over the abdomen. So you don't want to eat right before you're going on the stage. Why don't you want to eat? Well, you don't want to slow down your brain thinking. You don't want that blood diverted. But the other thing you don't want to have happen is you don't want food stuck in your teeth. And while you're trying to speak, you're trying to move that food out with your tongue. Very distracting to the audience. I've seen people do that. Good speakers. And when they do that, I never eat. Personally, I never eat before a speech. I just, they bring the food. If it's a dinner speech, I'll say, hi, just thank you very much, cover it up. Half the time it's gone, but that's okay. I can always figure a way to get some food later if I'm still hungry, uh, if my lunch didn't hold me over. So you have to have a presentation skill. That's the third thing. Now, what is the presentation skill? Well, we don't have time to go into all of it, but it's Kodak, Content Organization Delivery Action and Control. I take that from the word Kodak, it was a film company, but I, I changed it and I got the COD from a guy named Montalbano and I just added two more uh, letters onto it. Now, I have a note here that I want to tell you about content. There's a book that's written, it's called Strunk and White Elements of Style. I talk about it in my book. It's the best book ever written, in my opinion, on style. I talk about some other books. But even though you're talking about speaking and learning how to give a memorable speech, you want to learn how to write. You want to learn how to make things specific, concrete. You want people to visualize the scene that you're describing. I have, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll show up in the camera, but these are some old copies that I have. I bought so many copies of this. I help make them a bestseller. Why? Because I give them to my kids and grandkids over the years. And I say, did you read the book? And they give me that blank stare. I said, I bought another copy for you. So be sure to read it. Now they're in college. So I'm giving them copies again. And each edition that comes out has a little different twist to it. They tell different stories. But you know who White is? Guess who White is? Well, he was a writer for some famous newspapers and magazines but he also wrote Charlotte's Web. That's the white. He wrote Stuart Little. So he knows how to write and he knows how to entertain people. Now, the other thing, you wanna use rhetorical devices. That's all part of your elements of a memorable speech. So there are lots of rhetorical devices. I list many of them and give examples, but these are three of my favorites. Anaphora. What does anaphora mean? Anaphora means the repetition. Where'd you hear that? Well, I have a dream, Reverend Martin Luther King. And then he gives eloquent words to follow that. The next paragraph, I have a dream. And he continues down. I have a dream. That's the rhetorical device, the repetition. The other is, a rhetorical question. Let's go back in time. We go back in time a couple of thousand years in the book. Here's Cicero at the Roman Senate. 
with a rhetorical question. How long, O Catalan, must we tolerate these abuses? How long, O Catalan? It's a question that's not expected to be answered by the person. It's a question that dramatizes what's going on and it's done for effect. Another is the rule of threes. I'm just giving you some examples of rhetorical questions. And you go back and find the speeches you like the best, or you go back and look on the web for the 100 best speeches of the last century, according to this group, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, or whatever, and go through them. Many of them, you will see the text, but in all of them, some of them you can actually hear the words, and some you can see the video. And you will find, as you look at this, at this group of speeches, you will find all of these rhetorical devices. So that's a tip. Stories. The most powerful words in the English language. Tell me a story. That's Pat Conroy, the author, famous author. People remember stories. Maybe in prehistoric times, they gathered around after a big hunt around the fire and someone got up and told a story of the hunt and everybody was mesmerized by that story. That's what they remember. When I tell a story, I try to tell a story of personal experience because if you tell a story about something you read in the newspaper or on some social media site, somebody will stand up later and say, ah, that's not true, this, that. You tell your own story because you are the witness to your own story. One of the stories that I tell, I mentioned my dad was a policeman, a very heroic one. I was in medical school and a professor called me in and said, there's a hostage situation. Listen, on the radio, I was doing some work in the summer for this professor. We were doing an experiment and sure enough, a man had taken hostages in a town, in the town of New Orleans, and, and he had the people in there, held them at gunpoint. The police surrounded the home, and then a man came up in an unmarked police car in civilian clothes, and he got out and talked to the officer at the scene who was in charge. And after a minute or so, he started walking toward the house, took his coat off, a suit coat and dropped it on the ground. He reached his side and took out a 38 police special four inch Smith and Wesson six shot revolver, standard police issue of the day. He held it up and he put it on the ground and he walked to the front door. He opened the front door and the gunman took the gun and put it in the policeman's face and he said, now I'm gonna kill you. There was a dramatic pause. At that point, the policeman slowly raised his right hand and put it on the gunman's forehead. The gunman appeared perplexed and the policeman said, you have a fever. And the gunman said, what, a fever? He says, yes, and I know the doctors at Charity Hospital. I'll take you there now. I really have a fever? And with that, the policeman took the gun away from the gunman. Another policeman rushed in. He later told me, I never knew how my father that was my father, Dominic Palmasano. I never knew how my dad took the gun away from the guy, but when I gave a eulogy at my dad's funeral, this policeman came from the back of the chapel and said, doctor, I can tell you, I was there. And he said he was at the door and he rushed in. He said, I concluded the man was gonna kill your daddy. And I was prepared to kill the man immediately before he could hurt the other hostages. People remember that story. I told that story at my AMA inauguration because it's personal to me and I talked to the people involved and I heard it as it was unfolding over the radio with this professor of surgery. Now, in the book, I have what's called a speechwriter's toolbox. And what do I have in there on that clipboard? I have a clipboard here. So I have the, uh, I hope you all can see this. Yeah, it shows up a little bit. I have, I'm gonna read it to you. You don't have to read the words, but the elements of style by Strunk and White. I've already mentioned that to you. On writing, a memoir of the craft by Stephen King. You say, well, wait a minute. Why are you gonna know about all that? I'm not writing a novel. 
Well, what you should do is read people who write novels who sell millions of copies. What are they? They are storytellers. And what you want to do is be a good speech storyteller. So try to learn those tips. How to write a best sell, how to write best-selling fiction by Dean Koontz. Millions of books sold. I wrote him one time and said, this is the best book I've ever read on writing. And he wrote me back. I was surprised. I said, this guy, he probably gets thousands of mails. This is back in the old days before email. But at the end of his book, as I mentioned, he's got a chapter that lists all of the authors that he admires and what is important about that author. This one, sensory descriptions. This one, intrigue. This one, suspense. You can learn a lot from that. And you can use those tricks or tips. You can use that in your speeches. Tess Garretson, who wrote, she sold over 30 million of her novels, a retired physician. I met Tess in Maine when I was invited up there to speak. I was invited on two different occasions to speak. And I bid for her novels. They had a, a fundraiser for charity and I won the bid. And so they put me at her table. And so that's how I met Tess. She sold over 30 million of her novels and she was kind enough to write the foreword to my book. Read her works. The Fiction Writer's Guide to Dialogue by a guy named John Hogue. I learned about him through Tess. He was teaching also at a seminar she put on in Cape Cod. So you try to read people that are successful, learn from them, imitate the techniques in your own words with your own stories. I have McGill's Quotations in Context, second edition, second series. Well, you'll get quotations, but it will be in context. What happened when the Spartans, the 300 Spartans were killed? What happened? What about the contest they had to memorialize those Spartans? All of that's in there. And the other thing, I go to the great courses when I'm going on trips to give a speech or go to an AMA meeting. I just listen to these tapes on the plane. Some of these trips are quite long. You can listen to a number of these courses. And two of them, Angus Fletcher, he's a, a doctor, a PhD at the, uh, the Ohio State University. We have some Ohio State people and a judge from Ohio State that'll be tuned in today. Dr. Ms., uh, judge Brett. Spencer, we have my wife, sister of that judge, and they always point out it's the Ohio State uh, University. But he has a screenwriting course. Watch those people, learn from them and say, why? Why is it that they are so effective in teaching? You can be effective too. You learn those techniques. I think that's all I have on this particular sheet that I wanted to tell you about. And then I talk about uh, people on the, um, on, on the YouTube, I talk about uh, people that you might wanna watch on YouTube about equipment and so on, the practice equipment. And uh, I, I mentioned uh, reliable sources in my opinion. There are a lot of good people on there, but there a lot, there's a lot of poorly recorded stuff. You, you wanna learn uh, from the people that do good stuff. Now, in the beginning, you get up to give a speech. The first thing, you want to control the podium. So you tell them in advance, I don't want anything on the podium when I get up. Nothing. And they say, well, it'll be a computer. No, I'm sorry. You have to remove that. And if you're shy about that, you have somebody with you and you let them handle that. Let them be the bad man or woman, okay? Why is that? Because you may have some notes you need. You'll take these notes, you put them on there, and all of a sudden it slides off on the floor. You want control of the podium. Number two, I don't use slides, except in rare occasions. If I'm talking about a carotid endorectomy, I'm operating on an artery in the neck that causes a stroke because it has a pothole uh, also, and also. So I can show a slide to doctors. I'm not gonna be showing that to the lay public. Or it may be that there's a famous uh, bird that was believed to be extinct. Uh, it looks like the pileated woodpecker, but it's an ivory billed woodpecker. And they think back in the 30s, it was extinct. And then uh, a state legislator in Louisiana, he was out hunting one day with a permit and he saw this extinct bird, supposedly extinct bird. 
So to prove that he saw it, he killed the bird. He shot it. And then he brought it to the wildlife and fisheries and said, look, it's not extinct. Look, I just brought you a specimen. Now, that wasn't obviously the thing to do, but it's a true story. Now, if I saw one of those, I was speaking to a large international group recently. If I saw one of those, and it used to live right here in Louisiana, over the Chafalaya Basin, the largest swamp area in the United States. If I saw one and I like to do camera work, I took a picture of it. I would show that at the meeting. I don't care if the topic was on uh, carotid endorectomy, abdominal aortic aneurysm, or second. I'd say, by the way, I just want to share with you my excitement because I probably would get some Pulitzer Prize for that picture proving. And it, he's very, very large. He looks like the Peleid woodpecker, but much larger. And he's got this broad stripe underneath his wings, this white stripe. And so you would have the proof and knowing photography, you would get a good picture and so on. But if you're not doing something like that, here's what can go wrong. The computer goes wrong. I was giving a talk in Australia. My first book came out, they invited me to talk about leadership. Then he needed everything in advance, and I understood they have a different system over there. I sent it. I checked with the tech the night before. Everything worked fine. The day of, that tech was gone. Somebody else was there. They couldn't get it to work, so I had no slides. Remember the man who panicked on the stage, and they took him off? So I don't rely on those particular things. Now, when you get up there and you say, I really feel bad, I'm very anxious, and so on, that's good. That's fight or flight. That means you survive. The people in a battle who are very lethargic and say, oh, what's the big deal? They take them home in body bags, unfortunately. You want to be very anxious about this whole thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Now, the first 30 seconds when you walk out, you don't want to, I want to thank Joe Blow. I want to thank the dean. I want to thank this one. I want to thank that. People start tuning out. You don't want that to happen. What you want to do, you want to say thank you. You walk out on the stage, you say, thank you. And then you don't do anything else for about 15 or 20 seconds. That's the dramatic pause. And then the people stop playing with their phones, texting, and they say, uh-oh, this guy probably is in a panic and forgot what he's going to say. So they all pay attention. And then you start off with a story. A long time ago, when I was a little boy, there was little Johnny. And you tell the story of little Johnny. And you might, at the end of the speech, say, don't forget little Johnny, whatever it is that you're asking them to do, something that will help people in little Johnny's condition. But that gets their attention. What I do with medical school commencement addresses, LSU, Tulane, Oklahoma, when they invite me, I get up on the stage and I look at everybody, I do the dramatic pause, and then I say, sexy. At which point, the people in back of me start moving their feet. They're all in robes, and the parents are saying, who is this nut up here? We're here, we're so proud of our daughter, our son, a medical doctor today, and we got a guy who's gonna talk about sex? And I say, it's not, and then the, the kids, they don't really care what I'm gonna say, right? These young doctors, they're texting, is Sally gonna be at the party tonight? Is Joe coming? That's what they're doing, and suddenly they all stop texting, and they look at me. And they say, wow, this guy here must be senile. He's, he thinks we're in a sex meeting or something. And what I say, it's not what you think. It's SCC dash C plus two sentences. Science, ethics, compassion, courage. Do what's in the patient's best interest and do it with the patient's informed consent. Those are my six commandments of medicine. If I do that every day with every patient, I sleep well at night. No matter what the administrator tells you, you have to do. Oh, you can't readmit that patient today. Uh, we got a 30-day thing for Medicaid. Yeah, no, no, I have to do what's in the patient's best. But your contract's coming up in three weeks. Yeah, well, do what you got to do, but I have to be true to my patient. Science, ethics, compassion, and courage. Do what's in the patient's best interest and do it with the patient's informed consent. So then they all are in attention now. They, and the parents are relieved, you know. They say, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to talk about sex. So... The one speech I didn't put in my book that should have been in the book is the Gettysburg Address. And if you go to the Lincoln Memorial, you'll see that speech there engraved in the wall. 
But there are many things I could have put in the book. But I tried to be specific for the points that I was making. Now, I want to just read you this. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we all heard in the past, and I mentioned a little while ago, I have a dream. But look at the logic here, the powerful logic. And most people aren't aware of this part. He says, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. H-E-I-R, heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as the citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Now, that is powerful. He's giving his view of what has happened, the default on the promise, but it's logical. And it flows and it would make people in the audience say, hey, this is an important message. So in addition to his wishes and his dreams, I have a dream that one day I have a dream, he's also making the case a powerful point. And that's what good lawyers do when they're given their summation to the jury. They make the powerful points to convince the jury that their position, the person they're representing or the, the entity is correct. Now, I have, uh, we're in a crisis right now with the pandemic all over the world. And the politicians sometimes do a good job speaking about it, sometimes they don't. And there's a lot of politics back and forth and so on. But I have some speeches in there about a crisis. So let me give you some examples. The first inaugural address of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1933. We were in bad shape in this big depression. And you heard those famous words, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And then go to his Pearl Harbor speech, December 1941, Pearl Harbor, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th. The speech was on December 8th. And it's a very powerful speech. Barbara Jordan, let me read you a few words from Barbara Jordan at the Democratic Convention, the 76th Democratic Convention. I'm going to read it right out of here. I have it marked here on page 96. For those of you who have the book, I thought this was very powerful. All politicians should read this current politicians and future politicians should read this. And now what are those of us who elected public officials supposed to do? We call ourselves quote, public servants, but I'll tell you this, we as public services must set an example for the rest of the nation. It is hypocritical for the public of official to admonish and exhort the people to uphold the common good if we are derelict in upholding the common good. More is required. And she goes on and on. We must hold ourselves strictly accountable. And then he quotes, she quotes a Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. So I have excerpts from famous speeches and a speech that I use sometimes when I was in a personal crisis, I just tell the story of how someone who loves you and gives you wonderful advice can change the course of your life. I was a good student and I always did well in school. 
When I went to Tulane undergrad, I went there on a, on a, they called it an honor scholarship. It was a scholastic scholarship. And you had to maintain a certain grade. And I did well. And I got admitted to Tulane Medical School. But when I was at Tulane undergraduate, my advisor said, Donald, this was the Tulane advisor. He said, when you get to medical school, you're going to learn all about anatomy and physiology. What you want to do is have a broader view of the world. You want to concentrate on literature, English, psychology. I said, well, that sounds reasonable. Okay. So I did. And I took all these different courses and there were great English courses and I learned all sorts of things, I read great books from the past and so on. When I got to medical school, there was a rude awakening. First, a guy came in and he was nominated that year for the Nobel Prize. And he said, the only way you're going to pass this course is study with your three cadaver mates. We had four of us to a cadaver. And so I did what he said and I failed the first anatomy exam. I got an F. And I was really, really shaken by that. And I went home that night. My dad came home late from police work. And I said, Dad, I have to talk to you. And he put down the newspaper and he looked at me. I said, I'm not smart enough to be a doctor. I'm going to quit Tulane Med School. I failed the exam. And my dad looked at me and he said, son, you're smart enough to be a doctor. But you have to remember three things. Do your homework, have courage, and don't give up. You do those three things and very little in life is impossible. I did what he said. I changed my study habits and then I did well and I graduated with honors. Now, I was ready to quit, but I had a trusted, loving advisor who gave me the secret. And it turned out to be, what was it? It was the secret to success. Now, leadership is a few, it's with those three things, but a few other things added, which I talk about in my leadership books. So I think I've covered some of the ideas in the book. Um, I want you to always, I would suggest to you anyway, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I would suggest to you that you always have a two minute speech ready about yourself. If you're applying for a job, I tell the medical students, you're going to be applying for a residency. Now you don't want to go in there and start fumbling around with the words. You want to practice, practice, practice. Get out your phone, record yourself, listen to it. And remember, the audience wants to know the professor who's examining you, the employer who's, who may hire you and be your employer, wants to know really what's in it for them. So you want your two minute speech to point out not only are you good and you have certain qualities, but these qualities mesh to make this company better and enhance the reputation. And you want to practice that and do that. And I also have a question in there. You should be prepared for these two questions. And I would ask candidates who wanted to run for office at AMA if I was selected to be on the committee to recommend the people to be put on the ballot. Anybody could get on the ballot. But if you wanted a certain group like the Southeast delegation to not, you know, to be on your side and so on, you have to be able to answer the question of what is your strongest point? Nobody has a problem with that. But some people, very smart people have a problem with what is your weakest point for this job, for this position? You should think about that and be prepared because one day you will be asked that question. And you want to be able to smoothly go in and say that you have self-awareness, but you also have worked to correct that problem or that situation. At the end of your speech, what you want to do is you want to go back to little Johnny, if he was in the story in the beginning, and say, never forget little Johnny. And what we can do to help future little Johnnies is the following. You always want to have, when I tell people in debates, I've done a lot of debates on TV. I've done, you know, Good Morning America, the Today Show. I've done debates on Fox, on, on other programs, uh, national programs. Usually it's, we have different views on medical liability reform. Usually it's with plaintiff attorneys. Uh, and there's some great plaintiff attorneys. I, I, one of them in, is in my book, who's won, uh, had settlements of 
over a billion dollars and won trials over a million dollars. And there's a good interview with him, Russ Herman, you'll see it in, the, in my book. But uh, what you wanna do is make sure that you are leaving a message to the public. If, you, if your opponent in a debate, if we're gonna talk, let's say we're gonna talk about medical liability reform. And he says, well, doctor, tell him how much money you make. Before we start, tell him. Well, that's a diversion from the topic. You got the facts on your side in your mind anyway. And you say, we can discuss that and we'll talk about contingency fees if the, if the studio will set up another meeting for us, another TV show. But today we're here to talk about the woman who's pregnant and can't find a doctor when the baby's coming. And she has to go to another town, as happened in Texas, and she delivered on the side of the road. We don't want that to happen in America. Keep the topic focused. So we also have... In, in the book, what to do if you have hostile people in the audience. If you're talking about something political, there'll always be somebody who wants to disrupt. And that's okay. Uh, but you, you need to be prepared for that, not get frightened and, and how to handle it. And so I talk about that, what to do. And then the last thing, I will, this will be the last thing that will take questions. But the last thing is, what do you do before you go on? Do your glasses reflect back the light? If you have to wear glasses, then get the anti-reflection, okay? Watch some of the news anchors and so on. You'll see them, and all of a sudden, nobody's paying attention to what they're seeing because you're seeing the, the camera lights. You can always see the camera lights. You can see them in people's pupils many times, but with the glasses, you can really see them. So you don't want that. So you want to get anti-reflection if you need your glasses. I can really get by without my glasses because of the miracle of modern medicine. I had cataract surgery. I do a lot of photography and the whites look, look yellow. And my kids told me, my two daughters told me, Dad, we're not riding in the car with you at night anymore. You're dangerous on the road, you know? So I said, okay, okay, I'll get the surgery done. And so what you wanna do is, and if you have shine all over your face, you wanna ask, your significant other perhaps who might know more than you or go to a cosmetic counter and get some stuff that you can put on for the shine. You wanna do that. Little things like that for your appearance. Don't eat, I repeat that, do not eat. And so we're gonna stop now and uh, we're gonna do questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Donald, that was great. I just wanna leave a little bit of time for folks but it was so valuable and I appreciate it so much. It is time for questions, and it's important you stay muted. In the chat, uh, chat option, please begin all questions with a capital Q. Name your local store if you'd like, and we'll give them a shout out. Linda Marie, do we have a question? We do. We have a question from Copperfish Bookstore in Punta Gorda, Florida. Um, the viewer asks, my son belongs to a Toastmaster group, and I would like to send him your book. How does your book fit with their focus? Well, I think it would be good to send the book uh, to your son. Uh, Toastmasters has a good reputation. I've not been to a Toastmasters meeting, so I don't know that I can answer that, uh, but I would assume that they want you to be a good speaker and they give you tips. This is a book about tips based on a long experience. So I, I think it would work out fine. And uh, I, I would love to hear comments from your son after he goes to that meeting and, and if they critique it or advise that it's good or bad, just send me the word. We can all learn from each other. And I'll just insert, I have been to Toastmasters and I have read the book and they are a very nice fit. Linda Marie, do we have another question? Um, yes, I have a question from a fan of M. Judson Books in Greenville, South Carolina. What is one technique for dealing with a disruptor in the audience? Well, with a disruptor, great question. And you see it sometimes on TV when you're just a spectator. <clears throat> what you do is oftentimes they will do this. They will say, uh, they'll, they'll just jump up and ask you a question while you're giving your speech. And you'll say, there'll be time for questions later. And you continue on with your speech and they'll jump up again. And they say, I wanna know and say, I'm sorry, but that's not the format we're using today. We're gonna talk about what I'm talking about. And at that point, ideally, there's somebody who comes in and tells them to be quiet or they'll take them out of the place. But you don't want to 
engage, they will throw something at you and you don't want to respond to that because they have succeeded by taking you off topic. You want to stick to your topic. And it's the responsibility of the group that in, invites you to maintain civil order in the auditorium where you're speaking. I'll tell you another technique. Now, this happened one time at the AMA. There was a lot of controversy about some issue. And I was, I was on the board, then I wasn't the president. And the chairman of the board said, Donald, there's a group of doctors that are very angry. There's 200 doctors. They're going to have a meeting, and they want somebody from the board to talk to them. And I was up for re-election. I said, well, gee, thanks for uh, putting me out there uh, to get 200 votes against me. So, uh, but I said, yeah, I'll do it. So I went out there. And sure enough, as soon as I started to talk, this guy jumped up and somebody had taught me this some months before. So I just said, let me try this out because this guy's really, really angry. So I walked off the stage and he stopped and I walked right up to him and I said, I'd like to hug you. And the guy said, what? And I gave him a hug. At which point I said, I was just told a few weeks ago that when you have somebody with an opposing view, you should thank them because many times you can learn from that person. They may have the secret to the problem. So thank you. And he burst out laughing. Everybody burst out laughing. And I went back to the podium and then it was very civil after that. I'm not telling you if you got somebody out there who looks deranged, I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm just saying that there are all sorts of ways to deal with that. But usually the best thing to do is to say, we'll deal with these questions later. And if you think they're going to have a bunch of people jumping up, then what you can do, you plan in advance to have them put written questions down and send them to the aisle. People pick them up and then you can get the, the, the appropriate questions. If people are out there cursing or saying all kinds of stuff, then you disregard those questions. Hey, Linda Marie, we have time for one more question. And okay. we're going we're to send any extra questions to Donald after this and we will share the answers and the video uh, in the Lady Banks newsletter, which you can subscribe to at readermeetwriter.com. Okay, Linda Marie, our last question. Can you let us know how you're keeping yourself busy at home? You have so much energy and interest that it must be strange to have the challenge or luxury of staying home. Well, that's a great question too. Um, well, I'm, a, I'm an active person and uh, I enjoy lots of things. So it was, I, I, it was exciting for me during this time to learn how to put this equipment together to get good audio and good video. I hope it looks good at your end and it sounds good at your end. Uh, but I am fortunate is that I love photography and uh, I, I go in the backyard when I'm writing a book, uh, I take a break, I go in the backyard and I have a bird feeder and uh, I have two bird feeders now because the squirrels come and they hog the bird feeder. And I do close up photographs of the birds. So that keeps me busy. I also do Zoom teaching to the medical students at Tulane. And I attend the, uh, the COVID-19 discussions every week by the All Ains Parish and Jefferson Parish Medical Society. And we listen to the experts who are actually on the front lines treating patients. So it's a continual learning thing. And of course, there's always the opportunity to read. I'm fortunate that my wife, keeps me very, very organized. And she is a, uh, she's a retired attorney who actually left a partnership at a large firm in order to uh, travel with me and help me with my duties as AMA president. And so I'm very fortunate, but she's also, uh, she did the first edit on my book. She does a great job. So it makes it much easier for the people at the publishing office. So I'm blessed in that regard. Thank you, Donald, and thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. And if you enjoyed it as much as I did, let your bookstore know. Order the book from them. We hope, we hope to be scheduling scores of authors, so please be in touch with your bookstore with any suggestions or ideas for how this could have been better for you. And order giving a memorable speech from them. Thanks again, Donald, Linda Marie, and Nikki, and this is Wanda signing off. <laughs>